Hello, who are you? I'm Ty from New York Bunny Club. Hello, lovely to meet you. So how's your day been so far? What have you been up to today? Today I've actually been chilling out and writing a little bit at home because we spent all day yesterday in the studio and we kind of have got two new tracks that are almost complete so yeah we have a lot of new tracks that are almost complete but there's like another two now that are at that sort yeah. of final stage so that was really productive. So how's the writing process coming along? Is it <clears throat> Very well actually we've probably been more productive in the past year since we came off the Katy Perry tour than we've been at any other time in the band's history because normally we write an album as 10 songs and those songs are sort of complete in and of themselves and we don't write anything else so then suddenly when the enemy wants an exclusive you're a bit like uh, well, we've only got 10 songs that's all we were supposed to do for this album um but yeah this time around we've ended up with about 20 songs which is you know pretty unheard of for us and loads of other little bits of music which might well become more songs so it's been incredibly productive this record, by contrast, is com totally electronic. I mean, there's bass on it and there's guitar, but they're pretty minimal by our standards. It's much more, you know, keyboard based and vocal melodies. You know, I mean, I th it feels like a departure for us and it's much more forward thinking, I think. There's been a lot less of an emphasis on us kind of mining our pasts and thinking, oh, what would happen if you did this and referencing other records. And, you know, it's been much more about just you know, flinging, flinging the emotions at the wall and seeing what yeah. sticks, so. So saying that, so that's, so you're on your third album, and like, when it comes to the live show, how do you think it will come across playing material from the first two albums and playing this album? Well, this is what's interesting, because we're starting to think that we are going to have to, there's some things that will probably not work at all, like, played on in the same set, because this, the emotional extremes yeah. are so extreme, you're going from, like, real despair uh, you know, of a, you know, a de the death of a love affair with something like Architect of Love and then, you know, you contrast that with some of the, like, mega dancey stuff that's on the new album and that's not really going to sit in the same set. So, it, potentially, we're going to have to have several different sets depending on the environment. Like, obviously, the sort of set you play to your own crowd is very different from the set you play to a festival crowd or a club crowd or a Sunday afternoon crowd, so... But I think what we will definitely do is we will take songs from Fantastic Playroom and The Optimist and we will rearrange them in some way yeah. so that they're more like the stuff on the new record. Well, I saw you um, open for Katy Perry last year. Okay. And you said, you mentioned, so how was that tour for you? What was the Katy Perry tour? It like? was really fun. I think because we, we're very aware that we're probably, we're probably never going to reach those kind of commercial heights yeah. of being Katy Perry. And to a certain extent... You wouldn't want to, even though her life is amazing. At the end of the day, she can't leave a hotel room, and she, you know, there's a thousand and one things she can't do. Um, but yeah, it was immense fun. They treated us really well. Her crew were really lovely, um, and her kind of, you know, her main body of staff, like her managers, and you know, were very, um, very keen to kind of facilitate the whole thing, and kind of going, oh, we're really big fans, and Katie's a really big fan, and blah blah blah, and you know, we got to kind of live that life without actually having to live live that life. I, I read your um, your tour diaries that you're writing, yeah. quieter, so which were very enjoyable, and everybody was raving about them, they were very readable. What sort of inspired you to get involved with that? Um, well, I'm a writer, so, you know, it's not just about lyrics, is it? I mean, I write very bad sci-fi at home. You know, I've written, I've done sort of what you're doing with a few bands for various different publications, and the quietest have been real supporters of ours and we, we mooted the idea of maybe doing a blog with them and they were really excited so it just happened it was good actually to have something else to focus on yeah, yeah. you know because it meant that I'd be kind of living my life on the tour but at the same time you're kind of squirreling away all these little things that happen going oh this is really good I better put it in my phone yeah. so I don't forget about it so um just going back to sort of um 2007 when you yeah. when your Young Pony Clubs the debut album came out you're one of the um it bands <laughs> yeah no, not just the it band but you're also one of the leaders it was like you yeah. CSS the Claxons part of the new rave who else was it was it you CSS and the Claxons you were probably the sort of three yeah I would say I mean we, we all got lumped in together I yeah. wouldn't necessarily say we it all wasn't your choice it was no, like it was media like, sensation. Exactly. It's like, oh my god, bands yeah. that aren't just boys, bands that don't wear black, yeah. oh, bands that have rock and dance fusion. Obviously, they all sound the same. Yeah. We all got lumped in together. I mean, I think we have more in, in keeping in terms of the sound of music with 
a lot of bands that came after us. But you know, how did that? How does that? How did? How, what? What do you make of the concept of new rave now? That terminology. Well, I'd actually say in the wake of new rave, new rave actually happened because suddenly you know, the 90s became vintage and all these kids that weren't around at that time discovered, you know, early acid house and um, dance music and suddenly you're hearing, I don't know, 17 year old DJs at corporate gigs, you know, putting down Voodoo Ray and stuff and suddenly there's a load of music coming out that is essentially is actually new rave, like, oh my God, so much of the Hervé output. Yeah, yeah. It's basically new rave, so it was interesting that we, I suppose we kind of heralded that w- without actually making that kind of music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you feel about that, that eventually that bubble burst? Well, it has to burst at some point. I mean, I think you hope that you're going to walk away with things that are really important, like, you know, diehard fans and really good experiences. But the, I think the problem with that kind of make em and break em cycle is it's happening even faster yeah. now than it was even when I was, a, I was reading The Enemy in the 90s thinking... Oh, God, they're breaking down that band I love, blah, blah, blah. And it would be like a two or three year cycle now. It's about, what, six months? It's so easy. Like, bands aren't even getting to put albums out because they've already been, you yeah. know, cast aside in favour of the next more exciting yeah. thing. I think, though, if you have a genuine desire to do this, I mean, if you feel like it's your vocation and you have no other choice, then you're going to continue regardless of whether or not the press is writing about your music or not. And I think if you're making good music, then you know, you'll have that longevity. So, like, if going back to um, the new album, mm. so have you, have you got things like a date in mind, an album title? Um, we have an album title that we've been kicking around, but I'm obviously not going to tell you about it. Um, <laughs> because it might I'll... change. Um, then you look like an idiot. Uh, but, yeah, we definitely want it to come out by the end of the year, but we are hoping to release another single, uh, like a proper single, yeah, yeah. you know before then there's a few people that have come forward that might be interested in putting it out and to be honest with you even though everybody goes on about how amazing it is doing your own record it's bloody hard work you don't want to be a label manager you don't want to be a label manager no who has time it's like you have to you have to decide what you're good at in life and follow that star you can't you know have a thousand caps you know you can't wear them all at once it's very difficult being a label manager and being a performer that's on tour and is very jet lagged and someone's ringing you up and going, what do we do about this? And you're going, I don't know, I haven't slept in three days, please yeah. leave me alone. So. And you're trying to bring something fresh to the Exactly, do you know what I mean? So you, it, in an ideal universe, there'll be a label that will put the, um, the record out that isn't us, that we will work with. And we are talking with various entities about that. But we'll, you know, we'll see. Oh, cool, fab. And uh, how do you feel about the state of the music industry? Like people, like these days, not many people are paying for music. It's all about Obviously, branding and yeah. live touring and merchants. Do you download music illegally? Um, I do now, yeah. I think I got to a point where, especially during The Optimist, where I personally put a lot of what the money that I'd made into that record, as did Andy, and watching people downloading 18 months of your life essentially in terms of your hard work in like 15 seconds and not paying for it it made me feel sick do you know what I mean I mean we lost so much money in terms of of that record not being bought going onto the Pirate Bay or LimeWire and seeing 2,000 people downloading it you know in 10 minutes for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks do you know what I mean It, it in terms of me personally and this band's future, that represents a huge blow. So, you know, I kind of feel like, well, any judge that wants to take me to court, you know, for illegally downloading a record needs to then take all of the people who've downloaded my music to court. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's like... Yeah. It's, it's very difficult because on the one hand, I can, I, I can remember being a 14-year-old and having no money and thinking, well, I really want that record. And, you know, it was tough titty in those days. You just waited until you had enough pocket money and then you went out and bought the record. Yeah. But... You know, now the world is your oyster, and obviously, if you're a new band, that's great because your music gets out there, and everybody hears about you, and everybody shares you, and that's exciting. But once you are then on this treadmill, it makes things incredibly difficult, yeah. unless you're with a major label. And even if you are with a major label, as you are well aware, if you can't make a certain number of sales, you will be dropped. And once you're yeah. dropped, your name is Mud, and you're not going to make another record. So it's very difficult at the moment. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for taking the time. It's been really lovely meeting you finally. And yeah, yeah you thanks too. a lot. Thank thanks you. Fun.